Thank you, friends. It's good to be with you today. It's always a privilege to be here uh, in ministry with our brother R.C. Sproul. Uh, I thank God for your ministry, for the influence that he's given you. If you all have, uh, as pastors, enjoyed Together for the Gospel, you should know that while I'm one of the conveners of that, uh, Ligonier Ministries has been incredibly helpful behind the scenes with it. Uh, so if you've enjoyed DVDs of it, well, that's because of Ligonier Ministries. Uh, they basically let us know any way we could be of assistance, uh, we would like to be. So uh, we've, we've all enjoyed your teaching, we've enjoyed the ministry that the Lord has used you to raise up, brother, and thank you for this time together. Uh, I want us to think about especially this idea that R.C. brought up of the church being confessional, uh, the church being confessional. But uh, before I, I get into that, one of the things that we do at Nine Marks is to try to help churches, pastors especially, church leaders, think through what it means to be distinct. Who are we as the church? And we have a resource here, as Chris mentioned, that we would like to give to you. You got one of these cards as you came in, I think. If you fill this out or just uh, grab a business card, if you have a business card with your name and email on it, and go to the Nine Marks booth out in the portico right over there, uh, we have this new book, The Church and the Surprising Offense of God's Love, uh, Reintroducing the Doctrines of Church Membership and Discipline. So if those are things you've not thought of a lot before, you've wondered, would somebody please write a biblical book about this? Uh, that's what's done here by Jonathan Lehman. And actually, Jonathan is the uh, editor of Nine Marks Ministries. He's the, the writing director of it. And he's actually here with us today and tomorrow. He'll be at the Nine Marks booth. So the author of the book is there. Uh, he'd happily uh, give you a copy of the book for free if you just turn in your information. You won't get on any kind of spam lists unless you consider our e-journal spam, and then you can just mark it as spam, and you won't have to get it anymore ever again. But every other month, an e-journal comes out to pastors uh, with articles written to try to help us think biblically and theologically uh, about the local church. And this book is a great aid in doing that. So that's there for any of you uh, that would like a copy of it. Well, as we turn to this idea of the church being confessional, uh, let's go to God and ask Him to help us think well about this. Let's pray. Oh God, we rejoice in the fact that You have called us to be reconciled to You through Christ. Uh, we thank You for the one holy Catholic apostolic church You have made each one of us in Christ a part of. Lord, we thank You too that our church, each one individually and locally together, that we witness to that same gospel, that we confess the same faith. Give us wisdom about that now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this message is No Creed But Christ? Question mark. Well, where do you come up with a title like that? Well, uh, friends at Ligonier may suggest it. But it's, um, it summarizes a lot of American evangelical Christianity and has really for the last 200 years or so. The 19th century saw uh, a couple of different attacks on the whole idea of the church being confessional or having creeds. There's what we might call a sort of liberal attack and then a more conservative attack on the idea of the church having creeds. The liberal attack came from doctrinal minimalism, that is, as little specific doctrine as possible, please. This is a, a very popular position always in America. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, not known as a great theologian, uh, thought that creeds had been the bane and ruin of the Christian church. He wrote in a letter on June 5, 1822 to Thomas Whittemore, creeds have been the bane and ruin of the Christian church, its own fatal invention, which through so many ages made of Christendom a slaughterhouse, and at this day divides it into castes of inextinguishable hatred to one another. Well, the kind of dogmatic liberalism really came to a head in Schleiermacher in the late 18th century in Germany, where he valued experience over dogma, over doctrine. And that naturally accompanies a reduced faith in Scripture. Uh, and that culminates in the kind of doctrinal liberalism that we've seen for the last century in the World Council of Churches and slogans like Doctrine Divides, Mission Unites, or the in my mind, infamous statement of Peter Lee, the Episcopal Bishop of Virginia, just a few years ago, when he said, heresy is better than schism. Heresy is better than schism. 
Well, he said that in a speech that gently chided conservatives for imperiling the unity of the Episcopal Church's largest diocese, the Diocese of Virginia, because that denomination back in November of 2003 had consecrated their first homosexual bishop. And so Lee said, if you must make a choice between heresy and schism, always choose heresy. That was on January 30th, 2004, for those of you who take notes. For a heretic, he said, you are only guilty of a wrong opinion. Quoting Presbyterian scholar James McCord, as a schismatic, you have torn and divided the body of Christ. Choose heresy every time, end of quote. At the end of that, the delegates applauded, and I think they proceeded to follow his advice, I fear. But he then said, I hope we will avoid both heresy and schism. Well, Samuel Miller, in his famous defense of the creeds, and if you'd like a good thinking piece about this, Samuel Miller, 19th century Presbyterian, wrote a good defense of the creeds in 1839. He said, we shall find with few exceptions that whenever a group of men begin to slide with respect to orthodoxy, they generally attempted to break, if not conceal their fall, by declaiming against creeds and confessions. They have seldom failed indeed to protest in the beginning that they had no objection to the doctrines themselves of the confession which they had subscribed to, but to the principle of subscribing at all. I'm sure you've heard that. There was at the same time another more, what we could call a more conservative attack on creeds and confessions, another route. Uh, This is largely uh, came without any kind of anti-supernatural liberalism, as the authors that we've just been considering would have, but from a a more um, populist uh, frame, and this is generally associated with Alexander Campbell, no creed but the Bible. Uh, He's the the founder of the Restoration Churches, the Disciples of Christ, Christian Churches, Churches of Christ, and one of the streams that issued from him, the Christian Churches, uh, Churches of Christ, have often used the phrase, no headquarters but heaven, no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no plea but the gospel, and no name but the divine. Well, that may preach well in a single sermon, but you don't live that out well. Uh, There are questions that begin to be raised, and I think the restorationist movement that he was uh, the founder of have, have shown us that fully. Uh, Other people, though, have taken up that line. So, in Baptist history, the first president of the Southern Baptist Convention, W.B. Johnson, uh, wrote in 1846, can man present God's system in a selection and compilation of some of its parts better than God has Himself done it as a whole in His own book? It's not just among the restorationists and the churches of Christ that we've had questions raised about creeds and confessions. It's been among Baptists and other evangelical Christians. Uh, that have from no liberalism self-consciously, have from time to time raised questions about the appropriateness, given the authority of the Scripture, of having any other statement than the Bible itself as something that we are said to believe. In fact, in the recent unpleasantnesses, you could call them, the 1980s and 90s in the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, when we were roiling among ourselves about the authority of Scripture, Once again, this idea came to the forefront as priesthood of the believer became sort of 1920s E.Y. Mullen's sole competence, which became really 20th century First Amendment. Anybody can basically say what they want and believe what they want, and those rights of the society as a whole, the Southern Baptists actually used inside their churches against each other, against any idea of a statement of faith. So, in any number of ways, creeds and confessions have been attacked in the history of Christianity from inside Christianity. But when we look at the history of the church, even as we were just thinking of the Nicene Creed, uh, creeds became important so early in the history of Christianity because Christianity itself is focused on things like this, preaching and teaching, on, on speaking words and hearing and persuasion, not on the formal actions in a particular location aimed at a physical object as the idolatries of the pagans were aimed at. In fact, we see this even in the New Testament. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I'm not going to do an exposition of this passage. But if you think that creeds or confession summaries are not biblical, I would encourage you just to look here. Paul's topic here in 1 Corinthians 15 is the gospel that Paul preached and believed. And he begins by making it clear that the Corinthians' continuing adherence to this message is essential to their salvation. He says there in verse 1, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. So Paul there is exhorting them to hold firmly, hold firmly to something, to the gospel. If you look over at the end of the chapter, the last verse, you'll find he exhorts them there, dear brothers, stand firm. Well, it's a fair enough question then. What are they to hold firmly? What are they to stand on firmly? Well, that's what Paul summarizes in these amazing early verses of 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 3. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And then here it comes, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. Friends, in here you see the basic nub of the message of Christianity. The gospel implied, this is a summary of it here in these two verses. The Scriptures referred to here are the Scriptures of the Old Testament, of course, that predicted Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, and even under the influence of the Holy Spirit interpreted it in Isaiah 53. But notice here the objective historical content of the gospel. The Christian message is not just about a way we may want to view something. It's not fundamentally about how you find success in your job or fulfillment in your marriage or how you curb insomnia. It is about something Christ did for us in time and space and history with a particular meaning. He says there in verse 3, He died for our sins. R.C. mentioned the, the physical location of pulpits in churches and the Lord's table. And very often I've found in liberal mainline churches, uh, you'll have the table very prominently in the center uh, and then the pulpit usually off to the side. But even, friends, when they deny the gospel from the pulpit, it's interesting that at the table, again and again, the gospel is proclaimed as the words of institution are read, and His body broken for us, His blood poured out for us is repeated. The table declares the gospel even in churches that deny it from the pulpit. Eyewitnesses confirmed Christ's resurrection. Paul goes on, verse 5, that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And not only that, but you look at verses 8 and 10, you see that Paul himself had, by God's grace, become a witness too. And last of all, verse 8, He appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So here's Paul, this former persecutor of Christians, now was preaching this gospel with the zeal of a convert, giving his whole life to it. And how? Only by God's strength working in him. He finishes this section there uh, with verse 11, repeating, what he said in verse 1, reminding them that they had believed the message, this specific message that Paul had preached. Verse 11, whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. Now, friends, many scholars, if you read the commentaries, call these first few verses in chapter 15 the earliest Christian creed, especially verses 3 to 5. They have the structure of something set. You have five parallel phrases affirming Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and witnesses to that resurrection. Paul was probably writing this letter around 51 A.D. He's referring to what he preached to them some months or even a year or two earlier, and he's saying that even then that message was fixed. So, you see, it becomes clear then that the basic Christian gospel was not developing in the first few centuries 
as some scholars have tried to argue. No, friends, this is the message already completed. It is the message that God's Spirit used to revolutionize the whole Mediterranean world in the first century A.D. Christians have always had statements of faith, confessions, creeds. Our own local congregation in Washington, D.C. was founded in 1878 in February. Their very first act as a congregation was to adopt a statement of faith. And it is a statement of faith that we still believe, that we still affirm. We sign it in order to affirm that we have heard it taught and that we agree that this is what the Bible teaches and that this is true. Now, applications of the use of creeds will vary slightly between Presbyterian and congregational churches. What's in common is that whatever the final adjudicatory authority is, every member of it will need to affirm the church's statement of faith or confession. So for a Presbyterian church, uh, that's going to be the elders. Uh, For a congregationally structured church, that'll be the members of the church. Uh, That also explains why Presbyterian uh, Presbyterian creeds like the Westminster Confession Reformed confessions tend to be a little longer and more full. It's true that Presbyterians are brighter, but it's also true that we understand that as Baptists. We're okay with that. We read your books. We profit from them, you know. But it's also true that because in a congregational setting, uh, every member of the church has to affirm it because every member of the church will have a vote on matters. And so, therefore, the congregational statements, the Baptist statements, have tended to be a little shorter and simpler, like the New Hampshire Confession. Uh, that our church uses. From time to time, we'll use the Apostles' Creed uh, to show that we want to be clear that there is this unique message that unites all Christians together, uh, this Christian gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. So, this is a little bit of how confessions have developed. They're, They're not a new invention. They're there, I think, even in the New Testament. Paul would have used summaries of the faith. The church has always been confessional. Throughout its history, the church has made very careful, specific statements and Christians have continued to do that. Now, as we, though, get this idea of the church being confessional to interact with the real life that we live as Christians and pastors and churches today, we realize that there are some doctrinal positions that are primary that we will contend for, and there are others that are more secondary about which we can disagree with charity and love. And I think in our time together this morning, if we're going to really understand how confessions can work practically among us, uh, it would do us well to consider what is orthodox, what it is to hold the truth with humility, and what are those essential doctrines and those which are open to different understandings. Uh, It's a difficult topic, but if we're considering confessionalism, I think it's appropriate that we want to consider how we can do this, how we can hold on to the primary things and then differ in a manner appropriate for sinners saved only by grace about secondary matters. So I'd like to address this by setting out four questions for us to consider, right? Four questions. Number one, what's the confession for? What is it that we're thinking about? What what are we together for? Number two, what must we agree upon? The essentials. Number three, what may we disagree about? non-essentials. And number four, how can we disagree well? Now, any of these things could be considered at great length. I'm just going to be introducing each one of these with some initial thoughts, but hopefully they'll be useful and you can have further conversations about them. Number one, what are we together for? Number two, what must we agree upon? Number three, what we may, may we disagree about? And four, how can we disagree well? Well, we have to begin with any creed or confession is to ask its purpose. Who are we speaking to in our creed or confession? Let's summarize it like this. Number one, what are we together for? If you answer that, you'll know what kind of confession you need to have. The cooperation that we are aiming at should help us determine how much agreement we will need. So, for example, I can have a friend that I wouldn't marry, right? We don't need all the same things going on in the relationship just to have a friendship as you do to have a marriage. So I can, I, can, I can actually buy something from somebody that I wouldn't hire. I can, I can pray with someone whose church I wouldn't join. I can read a book by someone I would disagree with. I can think someone would do a good job at some things, but not at other things. 
So with reference to the kind of religious questions we have in mind, you have to ask yourself the purpose of your agreeing. What is the purpose of this confessional document? Uh, Would it be so that a lost person would come to agree with you about Jesus Christ and be saved? Or would it be so that the two of you could be in the same church? Would it merely be so the two of you could go to the same conference? Would it be in order to work together on the same project? What are the circumstances, the need, the purpose of your cooperation that then gives rise to this particular confessional statement? Christians have found that circumstances matter in their decisions about how to cooperate with each other. So, if you're in an area where Christians are being persecuted, there's more motivation to cooperate with a wider circle of people. Numbers may be small, fellowship hard to come by, uh, the encouragement of sharing and using the gifts of 30 people together rather than six or seven people each separated by their own little assemblies has led many a Christian in such a setting to work with people who in other situations around the world or in other times would form separate denominations over their different choices. So there may be more likelihood of Baptists and Presbyterians meeting regularly together, even if quietly, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, than in Orlando, Florida, because the numbers are fewer, the freedoms are fewer. Uh, And as we get into days in which Christians are in what's been called a position of a cognitive minority, that is, we don't think like most people in our culture think, a group which thinks differently than the majority around us do, well, I, I think we too may find ourselves becoming more aware of what we have in common with other Christians than many previous generations of American Christians have been. I think you can assume that for different kinds of cooperation, different levels of agreement are needed, okay? So we can have a pastor's conference here where we would agree on a great body of things, and yet to be members of specific churches, there would be a couple of other matters, not essential to salvation, but essential for how the church will operate together that we would have to have agreement on. So there has to be more agreement for the statement of faith, say, for a denomination or a local church for an ordained ministry than there does for a conference that you would do together. And there can be great good, I find, in working with Baptists and Episcopalians and Anglicans and Presbyterians and others who would share the same understanding of the cross and soteriology that we would have some differences in over ecclesiology. Great benefit to be had. And yet that doesn't mean then that in our local churches we don't also need to have our specific statements of faith and confessions for the purposes that they were set out for. Okay, here's another question then. Number two, what must we agree upon? What must we agree upon? Well, that's a dangerous question to be asked at all. You have to proceed very carefully here. If taken the wrong way, you know, it can sound like the teenager in the youth group asking, how far can I go? You know, what's, what's the least I have to believe in order to kind of get in? Well, that's not the spirit in which I'm asking the question at all. Brothers and sisters, you, you should want to believe everything that God has revealed in His Word. If He has revealed it in His Word, it is there for us. We are to to read it and understand it and believe it. But Christian fellowship can only be had with those who share Christian faith. In Acts 2.42, Luke describes the fellowship between the first Christians, and he says that they shared the apostles' teaching, and then it says that they shared fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. So in our own churches, we need to know what is the truth. We need to know what are those things that must be believed. Well, how do we come to the conclusions about what must be believed? Let me tell you three ways Christians have normally come to do this, three guides that we use together through the Bible, through our church, and through our consciences. Let's just consider these, each one briefly. We learn the truth fundamentally, supremely, finally, mostly through the Bible. It is entirely sufficient for faith and life. This is how God has revealed Himself, by His Word written. So study your Bible. Get to know God's Word well. Always be growing in your understanding of it. Pastors, encourage your people to read Psalm 119, to rejoice and to delight in God's Word. But God doesn't intend us to be earthly orphans. 
merely self-taught, self-regulated, self-centered. God has called us to be in local, visible churches that teach the Bible well and accurately and are full of people whose lives show the fruit of God's Spirit in them. So good teaching in a church should bear good fruit in our members. So the elders in our churches are supposed to be able to teach us God's Word. Paul is very clear about that in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So we should submit ourselves to them in their teaching. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 17. Christians together in a church should have a clear grasp on the gospel that saved them. Uh, The passage I want us to look at tomorrow morning is Galatians chapter 1. And it's fascinating that Paul there, when a heresy is afoot among some of the Galatian churches, he writes to all the Christians, not just to the elders, but to all the Christians telling them that if anyone comes and preaches a gospel other than that which they have received, let them be accursed, let them be anathema. He understands that the Christians should have a basic grasp on the gospel. So clear, so perspicuous is the basic Christian message that all true Christians should know and believe that gospel. Well, friends, that means that in our local churches, we define what we must agree upon as Christians, and we do that in order to be a member of that congregation. Our congregations give witness to the truth of what we read in the Bible. But then a a third source we also learn through our consciences. Each of us has a conscience. Now, by the fall, the conscience was radically harmed. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Our consciences can be given over, we see in Romans 1. But still, as a part of the image of God in us, there is that conscience that is in us. I love the image of it in John Bunyan's allegory, The Holy War. Uh, Many people have read Pilgrim's Progress, a wonderful allegory to read. But he wrote another one called The Holy War, not as well known. It's not as good, but it is good. And in it, you have man's soul presented as a town, and you have five gates of access into it, the five senses, ear gate, eye gate, nose gate, feel gate, mouth gate. And um, uh, of course, an ear gate is defended by a company of 40 deaf men. I mean, it's, you know, Bunyan's done it well. But inside man's soul, which is taken over by Diabolus, the upstart, uh, you have the town crier, old man conscience. And old man conscience is basically under the control of Diabolos, the usurper. But every once in a while, a fit will come over old man conscience. And he'll grab the bell and start ringing the bell and running up and down through the streets of man's soul, crying out at the top of his voice, Diabolus is a liar and a thief. Emmanuel is the true prince of man's soul. Well, in that, I think Bunyan powerfully captured the truth. That though all of us are fallen and every part of us is affected by the fall, God has still left each of us a witness, some witness in our conscience that bears witness. Now, our conscience is inherent, but it is not inerrant. It is inherent, it inheres in us, but it can err. And so we must educate our consciences according to the Word of God. We must teach and train our consciences. Now, how can we tell if a doctrine is of great importance to understand and for us to seek agreement on? Well, friend, you go, fundamentally you ask, how clear is this in Scripture? How clear do others think it is in Scripture, especially those you trust as elders, as teachers of the Word? How near is it or its implications to the gospel itself? What would be the effects of allowing disagreement on this? And we could go through the great doctrines of the Bible to consider what specifically must we believe. And I think what you see we have to agree upon is certainly the truth about God and who He is, the truth about the Bible as God's Word, and the truth about the gospel, uh, the essence. Because true Christian fellowship cannot be had with someone who disagrees with you about the gospel itself or about who God is. There are a thousand questions that can come up from that about implications. That's why the Ligonier Conference has so wisely arranged there to be Q&A sessions for us to be able to talk together and to ask R.C. ourselves what the truth is about these matters. (laughs) Okay, a third question. What may we disagree about? What may we disagree about? I want to be very careful about this. Again, I'm not trying to teach you how little you must believe 
but I am trying to help us think well about how we can cooperate. How can we, in a principled fashion, cooperate with those with whom we have some disagreements? Well, the answer to this question is best determined by the Bible and with the agreement of a Bible-preaching church. We can certainly have disagreements about practical matters, and indeed some of these matters of practical necessity will cause local divisions because you can't do the same thing two different ways. I mean, if this group of people is convinced it should be done this way and that group of people is concerned and, and thinks it shouldn't be that it should be done this other way, well, well you, you can't have it both ways. You know, you're, you're going to do one or the other. But they can agree, if they have the gospel in common, they can agree to work separately and with love and cooperation as they can. A good example of this, if you go to Acts chapter 15, if you want a, a biblical example of this, even in the early church, we see problems arising. Look there in chapter 15. You've had the council at Jerusalem, and so the letter of the council is being sent out to the, to the believers in the churches out in the nations, and there arises this disagreement. Paul and Barnabas came to opposite conclusions about how to most wisely pursue their work. Paul thought that they couldn't work with John Mark. Barnabas thought they should. So, instead of fighting about it, they parted company. Acts chapter 15, verse 39. Oh, if I can speak just to the senior pastors here for a minute. When that concerned member at the door starts threatening you with the ultimate nuclear bomb of them leaving your church, just remember Acts 15, 39. They parted company. You know, that might be the greatest gift they've ever given you. <laughs> Just realize in God's providence that not every Christian has to be in your local church. Not every Christian has to hear you preach God's Word every Sunday. Uh, let them, if, if, they're, if they're a Christian and they're not leaving in sin, let them go in peace with your blessings, encourage them, and help them not to be carnally minded. Consider this example not of fighting here but of parting company. You know, we have no reason to think that Paul or Barnabas started thinking the other one wasn't a Christian just because they had realized they couldn't continue to work together as closely as they had been because of this disagreement over a practical issue. So as we think specifically of churches, uh, we may categorize a group that claims to be a church as either true or false, uh, not meaning that the true church says nothing false nor that the false church says nothing true, but rather that the true church is preaching the true gospel and is following Christ's command to baptize and celebrate the Lord's Supper, including the practice of church discipline. Whereas a false church is one which has forsaken the preaching of the true gospel. So if we say a church is a true church, then we can fellowship with them in the gospel, even if we wouldn't agree with them on everything. Again, we have to have unity in the gospel in order to recognize each other as Christians. But it, it's clear from the New Testament that there were any number of other issues that even in the first decades of the church, true Christians differed about. Uh, the great place to go to this is Romans chapter 14. We won't go there now, but if you just write down that note, if you want to meditate longer on how is it that two Christians filled with God's Spirit, believing in God's Word, can actually disagree about what to do on something, Romans 14 is a careful meditation on that inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Paul concludes that discussion of meat being sacrificed to idols. What do you do about it? In verse 22, by saying, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. And basically saying, get on and keep working. Paul faced questions in the church about Christians regarding one day being more holy than another. Uh, Paul calls this issue a disputable matter there also in Romans 14. Now, I should just say, since I assume most of us here are Americans, Americans are terrible uh, when it comes to this matter of distinguishing between matters doctrinally, because we, we seem to be built with only two speeds. We have essential for salvation and unimportant. And in fact, there are lots of things in between those two speeds that we'll find. There are some things in the Bible that are not essential to salvation, but that are essential for having a church together. There are other things that are not even essential for having certainly salvation or even having a church together, but they're still very important. There are other things that are not essential for salvation or having a church, and they're somewhat important. Uh, there are other things that are not essential for salvation or essential for having a church together, and you can think in some circumstances they might make some difference. 
And there are other things that are not essential for salvation, not essential for, for having a church together that just really seem completely indifferent about, uh, you know, how you do that or what you look at this thing. So as, as Christians, if we're going to think well, particularly as pastors, we have to realize that non-essential is not the same thing as unimportant. We need to have different speeds in our thinking. Some things are essential for what it means to be a Christian. Other things are essential to agree upon in order to have a church together. Other things may be essential for other kinds of cooperation. And other things can be important even though they're not in any of those senses essential. So that brings me to the fourth question I want us to consider. How can we disagree well? Let's assume we're going to disagree. You may have heard this statement that came out of the German Reformation, in essentials unity, in non-essentials diversity, in all things charity or love. It's a good statement. Uh, We agree that essentials should be the place for unity and that love should be shown in all matters. So non-essential, though, the question is then with these non-essential matters, how much diversity is to be allowed? How are we to achieve the daunting command to to love in all of this? Well, friends, consider some basic questions. When you're disagreeing with somebody, consider, what do I owe the person who differs with me here? Well, I can tell you biblically, if they're your brother or sister in Christ, especially, you owe them love. You owe them respect. 1 Corinthians 13, think the best. What can I learn from the person who differs from me? Let's think about these two questions for a moment. What do I owe the person who differs from me? And what can I learn from the person who differs from me? What do I owe the person who differs from me? Well, the summary of that, the summary of that is love. Ephesians 4.15, we should speak the truth, yes, in love, respect. Do to others as you would have them do to you, Matthew 7, 12. So when you're in a disagreement, make it evident that you care about the person you're disagreeing with as a person more than you do simply about winning an argument for yourself. Listen to what they're saying. Try to clarify anything that you haven't understood. Always try to go for what people mean even beyond maybe the particulars of what they've said. Now, when you get down to a written document, you've got to then tighten that to what they're actually saying. But in verbal communication, give lots of benefit of the doubt. Uh, Guys, those of us who are married, think of what you've learned in communicating with your wife. You know, if we only use the exact words that are said, sometimes we're doing that despite what's clearly being meant in the moment. We need to be wise. We need to be humble. We, we need to listen carefully. The, 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 the thing that I think I've learned from this from a theology professor I had was a, a, a great lesson. When you're presenting a view that you disagree with, always present it as well as a proponent of it would present it, and if possible, even better, so that they would have no qualms about you having misunderstood or misrepresented what they've said. Always think carefully about the pros and cons of each present of each idea that you're considering. One of the most fruitful debates I've ever been involved in was with an extremely able PCA minister in our area. And I was concerned that the, the guys on my staff at the time didn't understand how strong the arguments for infant baptism were. Uh, and I thought uh, a Baptist uh, uninformed of that is a Baptist in danger. So I wanted to say, let's think carefully together. So I got in the the sharpest PCA guy I knew to come and talk with the staff. But we did the debate a slightly different way. I I knew this brother fairly well. We had loads of theological agreement and, and mutual respect. So we got a big whiteboard, and we took turns writing down statements on the board that we thought the other one would agree with. So it put to bed all kinds of caricatures, and there was an amazing amount of unity, we could say, about the Old and New Testaments, about circumcision, about sign of the covenant, about hypocrites, about who's saved and who's not saved, all kinds of things. And it teased out very nicely what we couldn't say. So we, we, we let it go on as long as we could, putting down as much as we thought we could write down the other person would say that we could agree on. And we came up with a very full conversation and teased out some very nice specific points uh, of disagreement. It was a very informative way to do it. 
when you're involved with other Christians, try to consider what goals you share. One way I try to consider this is it's thinking of a kind of decision tree. Uh, if I'm standing here in this certain point and then, it, then uh, we come to different conclusions, I want to go back and say, well, where were we together? Now, at this point when we were standing together, why is it that when we're looking at the same information, my friend whom I esteem steps this way and I conclude this way? What's behind that? What are the reasons there? Just to try to understand. A second question about how we can disagree well is to ask yourself, what can I learn from the person who differs with me? After all, perhaps it's the case that I am wrong. And I mean, short of heaven, I think we have to have the humility to say, what if it's the case that I'm wrong? Certainly, I can learn something of my own assertiveness. I can learn the temptations that I face in discussion. Uh, I have to ask myself, am I more interested in winning a discussion and safeguarding my reputation or in discovering truth and leading it to triumph. A few years ago, I was reading a biography of John Wesley, uh, and I ran across this brief account. I, I quote, it was customary for the itinerant and local preachers to take breakfast together on Sunday mornings at City Road. This is the, the first Methodist church there in London. On one occasion when Wesley was present, a young man rose and found fault with one of his seniors. The Scotch blood of Thomas Rankin was roused, and he sharply rebuked the juvenile for his impertinence, but in turn was as sharply rebuked himself. Wesley instantly replied, I will thank the youngest man among you to tell me of any fault you see in me. In doing so, I shall consider him my best friend. Now that takes humility. It takes a love for the truth more than for what people think about you. But friends, without humility, we can't learn. We can't learn the truth about ourselves, the truth about the Bible. You know what the ancient Greeks said was the opposite of a friend? Not an enemy, but a flatterer. A flatterer. God pity the poor pastor who surrounds himself with flatterers. Oh, friends, we need people who are friends, who are true friends. We need to realize that pride is our greatest enemy always. Welcome correction as a good enemy to your pride and appreciate the way that those who differ with you can sometimes help to, to fill out or, or, or better balance uh, positions that you've taken. It's good to have friends that can disagree with us on some things. It gives us opportunity to exercise our love and our charity. Handle Scripture carefully and in context. Know the Bible well. Love God by loving His Word. Meditate on Psalm 119. I love those words of Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. So, friends, you put it all in perspective, and that's what we're trying to do with our creeds and confessions. We're trying to teach. We're trying to gently, faithfully teach. We're trying to protect the truth guard from error, and be a foundation of unity. Creeds and confessions can help us with this. We always want to be for the gospel and for continuing to be reformed by the Word of God. So, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, diversity. In all things, love. Creeds and confessions can help us with this. I close with two 19th century defenses of creeds that I think you may find helpful and instructive. Uh, the first comes from a Baptist pastor in Richmond, Virginia, uh, writing just three years after W.B. Johnson wrote that questioning of creeds and confessions in 1846. In 1849, J.L. Reynolds, pastor of the Second Baptist Church in Richmond, responded. He wrote, this objection proceeds on an erroneous conception of the nature and design of a creed. It's not a compilation of some of the parts of God's system, nor does it consist of select portions of Scriptures. It is a digest of the whole, presenting in a small compass and in the shape of distinct propositions the great principles which constitute the system of revealed truth. In the Bible, these principles are not merely exhibited, they are expounded and defended at large. Moreover, a creed is not intended to supersede the Word of God as the standard of faith and practice 
for it derives its validity and authority solely from its agreement with that word. It is a standard or rule of faith only in a secondary sense and only to those who adopt it as the exponent of their views. It does not create. It simply expresses the truth and is to be viewed not in the light of an authority but a testimony. The adoption of a creed on the part of a church indicates not what it is to be but what is already believed. It is an expression of its cordial reception of the truth and sets forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among its members. And then the second defense from a friend of his across town, the Presbyterian theologian, Robert Dabney. There is not and there never has been a body possessing any organic consistency as a church or denomination of Christians which has not had a virtual creed, if unwritten, additional to the mere words of Scripture. The only real difference between these professedly creedless bodies and the Presbyterian church is that their unwritten creeds are less manly, less honest and distinct, and therefore more fruitful of discord among themselves than our candid, published, and permanent declaration. And here is one of the legitimate uses of our creed. When we invite men to share with us our responsibility as witnesses to God's truth, they have a right to ask us what the tenor of our witnessing is to be. It is but dishonest child's play to say, Holy Scripture is the creed to which we witness. When the inquirer knows that every party of heretics and enemies of God's truth is ready to give the same answer, we give a clear and honest reply. We say to the inquirer, here is our printed creed which expresses the propositions we believe the Scriptures to teach in carefully chosen words, whose meaning is as unambiguous and as recognized at this time with those who dispute our views as with ourselves. If these words express your views of the Holy Scriptures, you can come and witness with us happily, honestly, and usefully. If they do not, we neither persecute nor unchurch you, but leave you under your responsibility to your own God to select the affiliation which suits you. Such a creed, instead of causing of schism, is a source of mutual respect, brotherly love, and substantial agreement amidst minor differences between the several branches of the church Catholic." End of quote. Brothers and sisters, creeds and confessions can help us to so unite around the gospel and so love each other and love those entrusted to our care and those outside with God's Word, all of whose Word is truth. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank You for the great help that we have found in the labors of those who've gone before us. We pray, Lord, that You would give us a humility as we read Your Word. Give us the discernment of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Help us to understand the truth that You've inspired. Instruct us Make us good teachers of Your Word, and so build up Your church through our ministries, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.